Good morning and salam sejahtera to all the attendees. I am Hasma Izan from Energy Security Unit at IPRI Unisi Tenaga National. I trust all of you are keeping well and staying safe wherever you are. It's a great honor for us having all of you today. Welcome to the second series of Energy Life Webinar organized by the Institute of Energy Policy and Research, also known as IPRI. I believe most of you are familiar with IPRI, but please allow me to introduce IPRI once again. IPRI was established as part of Unitain Strategic Transformation Initiative to be in the front line of research and consultancy activities. IPRI has received a strong support from Tenaga National Berhad TMB, the Energy Commission, as well as the Ministry, where the establishment of IPRI on 11 August 2009 is very timely, as Malaysia need to focus on the energy environment, which will contribute to the government, corporation and other stakeholders in making informed decisions. To this webinar, Global Energy Transition in the Post-Corona World is a continuation from the first webinar which was held on 12 May 2020. In the second webinar, Professor Ken Koyama will highlight the challenges of global energy transition in the post-pandemic era. This webinar is being recorded and is scheduled for one hour, including 20 minutes allocated for Q&A session. If you have any questions, please start your questions on the Q&A feature. Please also fill in the feedback form as attached at the Q&A feature. Before we begin, let me introduce our speaker. Professor Dr. Ken Koyama is the Chair in Energy Economic of Energy Commission and Chief Economics at the Institute of Energy Economics Japan, IEEJ. He is currently a Senior Managing Director of Strategic Research Unit at IEEJ. He is a visiting professor at Shibora Institute of Technology Japan, visiting professor at University of Tokyo and adjunct professor at Tokyo Institute of Technology. He was awarded Brand Laureate International Brand Personality Award in 2016 and a member of several committees in Japan and around the world he includes Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry Japan and member of International Advisory Board Energy Academy of Europe, Netherlands. Ladies and gentlemen, it's now our pleasure to invite the Chair in Energy Economics, Professor Dr. Ken Koyama, to present his talk. Please welcome Professor Ken Koyama. Dr. Smaizan, thank you very much indeed for your very kind introduction. Uh, good morning to you all. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to be back in Malaysian organized uh, web webinars and to meet you all again. Uh, I hope that uh, you are all safe, well, and peace during uh, this extremely difficult and, and, and uncertain time caused by the pandemic. I heard that uh, the Malaysian government decided to enhance the, the lockdown measures to combat the situation now ongoing in Malaysia. I think this is true in Japan as well, but I hope that in the near future, everything goes back to normal. Today, I'd like to speak about the energy transition in the post-corona world. And I think this is an extremely timely and important topic for everybody, including those in Malaysia as well in Japan and in the world. So I'd like to start sharing my slide. So my dear Secretariat, can you stop your sharing of the slide? Thank you. I hope you can see my slide. Uh, if any, you have any problem, uh, please let me know or let Secretariat know so that I can amend problems. Again, I think that the global energy transition in the post-corona world is very, very timely. Probably you may know that uh, about last week, that International Energy Agency, IEA, published its uh, latest flagship long-term outlook World Energy Outlook 2020, which really highlighted the issues on the pandemic and world energy market. And I think that everybody in this industry and in energy policy arena need to understand what is happening now. 
But at the same time, I would like to draw your attention that we are actually now experiencing that the ongoing energy transition from, how I would say, the era of oil to the new era. Still, it is true that we are heavily dependent on oil. Oil is the number one energy sources in the world, in many countries, and I think that this situation will continue. In other words, oil continues to be very important. But clearly, the share of oil is declining, and the share of natural gas, share of renewable, share of nuclear power, non fossil fuel are increasing. So what's going to happen is open for us. But at the same time, we also know that the human society have, has experienced the past energy transition in the last, say, more than 200 years. Before the industrialization, human beings are dependent on natural energy sources, so-called animal power, human labor, uh, windmill, water field. These are the energy sources dominant before the industrialization. But industrialization means we people in the in that industrialized world need a large volume of energy. That's why coal first became a king of energy source. The position of king taken by coal lasted long, almost 100 years. But in the 20th century, because of the rapid diffusion of motor, motor, motor vehicle, the century of oil started. And again, as I mentioned earlier, oil is still the largest primary energy source in the world. Share is declining, but almost 40% of primary energy sources is met by oil. But we all know that particularly after the 1970s, when oil crisis, in other words, energy securities became a key issue to think about the energy choice, the oil substitution policy started or kick off, kicked off by many countries. That's why nuclear power, renewable, new energy, and natural gas, the share of these energy sources started to increase at the cost of declining share of oil. In the 21st century, we are now entering the new era, as I mentioned earlier. Probably the need to tackle on the decarbonization, the need to tackle on the enhancement of energy security will lead the way for our ongoing energy transition. So in this regard, advanced technology or innovative technology, such as zero emission vehicle, renewable hydrogen, will be the key factor to determine the course of the ongoing energy transition. But now everybody knows we are now suffering huge very, very large scale disaster caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Possibly the impact of the pandemic can transform the world society, politics, economy, and energy market. And again, technology can be a key to provide us a reasonable solution. That's why Technology supremacy may be the key word or key issue to decide the winner in the global energy transition to the 20, mid to, to the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years to come. But I would like to make, ask you to step back, not to go on the, the directly to the 20 or 30 years future to look at what is happening now in the world energy market, or what is likely to happen in the near term. 
which is the key to understand the long-term trend for the future. Now we are seeing the unprecedented impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. And because of that, the whole world energy market is characterized, particularly for this year, of substantial oversupply and lower energy prices. As I'll touch upon later, oil market is the most symbolic uh, development. We saw that the most symbolic development in oil market, but oversupply and low energy prices are common in oil market, gas market, LNG market, coal market, and electricity market as well. So that the impact of the pandemic is so wide. But apart from the pandemic, we are also seeing the many, many numbers of the important factors affecting the global energy landscape, such as the still ongoing US share revolution. And also, we need to understand that Asia will be the key area, key region to affect the global energy transition, because Asia is the gravity center of the world energy demand. What is going to happen in Asian energy transition will be the key to affect the course of the global energy transition. And also symbolic events such as heightened US and China tensions, energy geopolitics is now revisited. We must pay attention to what's going to happen in the world politics world relation and world geopolitics. And also environmental issue is continue to be the very important element to affect the ongoing energy transition. Climate change is of course the most serious and the most important issues to be considered. But for many Asian countries, air pollution, water pollution is also a very important emerging imminent threat to the human life. That's why advanced and innovative technology are looked at high, with high hope to play a key role to give us a good solution. As I mentioned, what's going to happen in Asia will be the key part of the story for global energy transition because of the importance of Asia. As, as you know, that Asia is now facing the very serious three E challenges. First E, energy security. Asia is going to see that the rising import dependence, which has a big implication for energy security. Particularly for oil import dependence and gas import dependence is also rising. And oil import dependence nearly equals the higher middle import, import dependence and also that long sea lane dependence that Asian country, including Malaysia, need to understand the meaning of that import dependence. And also the unique future feature of Asian energy mix is extremely high coal dependence. And clearly this will create a number of challenges and problems for the environmental protection, climate change, and pollution for both sides, I think that the heavy dependence on coal in Asia is a source of the problem. The third E, economic efficiency. Many Asian countries are tackling with energy market reform in a bid to streamline the industry to have a more competitive energy market. And one of the mean, uh, meaning is how to realize the affordable energy prices by various policy measures taken by the respective government. In terms of the energy market reform in Asia, Japan is leading the way, but I think including Malaysia, many countries in this region is following to step up the energy market reform. This is a picture taken from the IEEJ's long-term energy outlook. As you can see in the red part of the right-hand side picture, uh, sorry, left-hand side picture, developing Asian countries 
accounted for majority of the global energy demand growth. Actually, more than 60% of the demand growth comes from the developing Asian country. And even after 2050s, 30 years away from now, I think that it is quite possible and likely that the Asian country, developing Asian country, will continue to see the energy demand growth because of the economic development and population growth and other macroeconomic factors. And also, this result in the imbalance between supply and demand of energy, in particular in Asia. As you can see the picture in Asia, in the center of this slide, Asian energy demand shown in red bar is far, far away high, higher than the supply bar, which is shown in blue which means in the year 2050s, towards the year 2050s, Asia is going to become serious import dependence. As a region in the world, energy import dependence continue to be a problem, but situation is not so different from as of now. Actually, the import dependence issues is a key feature in Asia. Of course, it's as Asia going to become important in the world, import dependence issue is a global issue, but in particular Asian countries, it is very important. And another crop problem is our own energy mix or unique nature of energy mix. This is a comparison by region, Asia, Europe, United States, and world average of the primary energy mix and clearly you can see that how we people in Asia are dependent on grey part, which is coal. Of course, coal is important simply because it is abundant, it is competitive, it is very usable energy for many Asian countries, in particular, as of now, China and India, but it is also same in Malaysia in terms of the affordability of energy price, coal is now best utilized in Asian countries. There's no problem about that. But if we really need to tackle with the climate or air pollution issues, Asian countries are now required to step by step to clean up our energy system. In other words, to reduce the dependence on coal, to increase the share of cleaner energy sources such as natural gas or renewable or other cleaner energy sources or innovative cleaner energy sources. But if we look this picture from the optimistic angles, we can say that there is much room that Asian countries, including Malaysia, has much good or capacity to increase the share of cleaner energy source at the cost of coal. At what pace the shift away from coal or transition from the current system depend on many factors, technological development, cost reduction, infrastructure. It's not easy, but we are now on the track. But the situation became very much complicated because of the impact of the pandemic. So far, more than I have that the latest news tells me, 40 million people in the world are affected in cumulative time, and a large number of people are died because of the pandemic. Many countries hope that the pandemic may peak out, but the situation is not clear at all. There is a possibility that the second wave or third wave may hit us, give us serious damage. If we look at the situation in some of the European countries, now the situation became very, very serious again. Under the circumstance, the world economy is still suffering from the, the serious damage caused by pandemic. And now we are now in the very, very worst situation since the Great Depression 
experienced in the late 1920s. And in terms of the impact on energy demand, the city lockdown, which is now taken in Malaysia as I have, the lockdown is very important, which can restrict the, the movement of people and goods or the well-functioning of the economy. That's why the lockdown leads to the substantial decline in energy demand, in particular for transportation energy, that is oil. And because of this, we all experience the extremely low energy price, as I mentioned, but these low prices create very interesting supply responses and demand responses. Actually, the market is always functioning. An energy proverb says that the best cure for low price is low price itself. Or the best cure of high price is the high price itself. What that means? If the price is low, supply is gone and demand picks up. That will lead to the new equilibrium. So I think that this is what is happening now. But how long, at what pace that we can see the new equilibrium is still uncertain. But anyway, we are seeing a very interesting and very important market reaction or market responses in both supply and demand side. But during the course of this the transition to new equilibrium, already we have that the impact of low prices on investment and producing economies. I'll come back later. And more importantly, even if the pandemic is over or most the situation is stabilized, there is a possibility that the pandemic creates a kind of structural change which has a longer term implication for our global energy market. As I mentioned, we are still in the very, very difficult or the worst economic situation. This is a scenario, three scenario prepared by IEJ, which I, I remember that I uh, have shown you in the last webinar. The latest IMF projection said that this year, 2020, the world economy growth is minus 4.4. It is a very serious situation. Even after the Lehman crisis, the global economy, the shrink, the rate of shrink is just 0.7%. The 4.4 growth, negative growth, is very, very serious. And more importantly, we don't know what's going to happen in our economy, depending on the future course of the pandemic. As shown in the pink bar, in the left side, right side, and the dotted line, red dotted line on the right hand side, if we have seen the very serious second wave of pandemic, the global economy will not pick up even next year. I don't see, I don't want to see this happen, but there is a possibility. Of course, I am a great believer that humankind can finally overcome this pandemic and hopefully soon. And if hope that this happens soon, the next year we may see the strong economic recovery shown in the blue and red line. But it is still uncertain. Under the circumstance, energy demand will follow the similar trend of that of the economic growth. Many energy experts are now forecasting that the next year, 2021, the oil demand may pick up from the bottom of this year. And probably if we are lucky enough, the global oil demand may be back on track, the trend before the pandemic. But depending on the circumstance, in particular, depending on the possibility of the second wave, global oil demand may continue to stagnate as shown in the lead dotted line. No one knows. 
And this may create a very important implication for the global oil market. This rather difficult uh, visit chart simply illustrate that from the second half of this year, many oil market analysts suggest global oil demand may be higher than the oil supply for the next year, which means that we are heading for the rebalancing of the oil market. That's why the oil price, global oil price, rebounded from the bottom of negative price recorded in April to around $40 per barrel as of now. It's a good sign, which is a recovery of the oil price, although the $40 is not high enough for many oil producers or energy industries. But Interestingly, after returning to the $40 range, oil price will not go up. Why? There are several reasons. Firstly, many people in the oil industry is still uncertain about the economic and oil demand recovery. Again, as I mentioned, if the situation of the pandemic became serious again, and many countries started to introduce that the city locked down, down, just as a case in Europe and just as a case in your country, oil demand may continue, again became stagnant. And once that oil price going back to the $40, I think it's very important to understand the economics of the, the U.S. shale oil production. U.S. shale oil production is high cost oil, when the oil price is zero, ten dollar, twenty dollar, naturally the production started to decline. But now forty dollars, the, the reduction seemed to stop. And if the oil price go back to fifty dollar, sixty dollar, it's quite possible that the U.S. shale oil production started to pick up again. That's why, by many factors, suggest it's quite likely that oil price remain the, at the current range of $40 plus minus 10, depending on many circumstances, but this has a big implication. Why? I do believe that the OPEC plus country need to continue the historic joint oil production reduction. In the short term, it is Hard, but it is achievable. But in the longer term, that the such large scale supply reduction is really, really challenging issue for many producing countries. What about gas? Very similar picture for oil. This year, that the demand for gas and LNG declined very substantially due to the effect of pandemic. And many people are hoping the demand for gas, LNG, and cleaner energy sources can pick up quite substantially in the year 2021. But again, if the situation was in terms of the pandemic, the demand for gas, LNG may continue to stagnate. Even before the pandemic, the global LNG market this year are featured by the oversupply. In the right hand side picture in the 2020 categories, the blue bar, the supply capacity, stood at, stands at 381 million ton, while demand projection before the corona is 369 million ton. Even before the corona outbreak, the global energy market is characterized by oversupply. But now, Further right, because of the effect of the pandemic, the global energy demand is less than the previous demand forecast, hovering at around 310, 320 million ton, which means that very substantial oversupply exists in the energy market. Uh, energy market. As I mentioned, this extreme oversupply and low price created a very significant supply and 
demand responses. But from supply side, oil is very unique because of the existence of OPEC plus. OPEC plus is a gathering of the countries the respective participating government of OPEC plus strategically decide to reduce production. Your country should reduce X amount. Your country should reduce Y amount. So there is a strategic decision made by the participating countries. And this is a very unique in the sense phenomenon. Without this strategic decision taken by OPEC plus, I do believe that the oil market is still seeing a much, much lower prices. And in addition to this strategic decision taken by government, I, had, I would like to emphasize the importance of economic factors. Very simple factors. When the price is low, the high cost production need to go from the market. This is a very symbolic event shown in the reduction in U.S. oil production, shale oil production, before the coronavirus outbreak, early 2020, many forecasters see that the U.S. oil production is likely to increase by around 1 million barrels per day from the previous year. But now, everybody sees that the U.S. oil production is likely to decline by 0.7 million barrels per day as compared to last year. The net result is that the coronavirus, low prices, will reduce US oil production by 1.7 million barrels per day, which is enormous. Variable gas, unfortunately, there is no OPEC plus function in the gas market or LNG market. There is no gathering of the government to decide which amount of LNG should be reduced for your country and other country, the only factor is the economic factor. When the price of LNG declined very substantially, high cost LNG supply production need to go step gradually. So I think that the economic factor only works in LNG and gas market. And demand side also that oil and gas sees a little, a little bit different attitude or response. In case of oil, again, that the strategic response by major consuming government is very important. What does it mean? For example, in the last several months, Chinese crude oil import volume was very rather high even though their economy is picking up after the corona. Probably the reason why the increase in the crude oil import in China is to best utilize the low prices to build their strategic petroleum reserves. In terms of oil demand, the city lockdown is the main factor, not the price factor in terms of, if you see the situation, if the gasoline price in your country is reduced by 1% or 2% or 3%. I don't think that the many driver will use this opportunity to, to drive more. But in terms of gas and LNG, I think that the price matter because of the competition in the market price place. And once the gas price or LNG price declined very substantially, there is a possible incentives or stimulus for the consumer to use more gas or to use more cheap gas or LNG. So I think that the market reaction is continue to work, but the point here is already we are seeing a very serious impact caused by low prices to the industry and countries. For many international oil company IOC, and the national oil company NOC, the low prices and low demand creates a big financial damage. That's why they need to cut cost. They need to serious effort to streamline their uh, operation, and that resulted in the, the significant reduction in the needed energy sector investment. 
as far as far as I know, almost every IOC and NOC uh, decide, decided to reduce their energy investment by a factor of 20 or 30 percent in average in the world. What the meaning of the reduction in energy demand, uh, energy investment, is the lack of future supply capacity. If everything go normal for the years to come, the lack of investment creates a hitch or imbalance in the supply demand of energy in the world. In the world. And also the problem is really serious in the many producing oil and gas producing country, which heavily dependent on oil and gas revenue to run their economy. And furthermore, many producing countries in the Middle East, in Russia, in this region, is suffering from the COVID-19 expansion in their domestic society. That makes things more difficult. So all in all, I think that the situation in producing country became very, very fragile or uncertain. So in other words, low prices created a lack of investment, a difficulty in producing countries, which means that the source of future instability is now emerging. The second and most important part is a structural issue. Oil demand may structurally restrain, or in other words, we can see the peak oil demand quite soon. In short term, city lockdown is a cause of oil demand reduction, but social transformation caused by the best utilization of information technology and digitalization may be the factor to see that the oil demand peak in the world. And the best use of electrification, uh, best use of uh, information technology and digitalization means the acceleration of electrification. And we need to ask what that means. And also another third important issue is the relation between the decarbonization initiative and the impact of post-corona. And finally, in the post-corona world, I think that the geopolitical situation or geopolitical tension in the world may be enhanced. So all in all, I think that there is a significant possible impact on transition and technology supremacy. As you can see, there are many, many long-term oil projections published by various institutions, IEA, IEJ, ExxonMobil, BP, Shell, others. There's a wide variety or a diversity of long-term energy projection. But now, interestingly, many forecasting based on many scenarios started to argue that we may see the peak oil demand. The degree of peak or the decline differs greatly. And actually, it is quite possible because of the social economic transformation to reduce movement demand or transport station demand can lead to the peak oil demand. But re please remember, in this picture, you can see the uh, orange line shown in BP net zero, which is uh, the very latest version of BP output, and also the IEA SDS, Sustainable Development Scenario, which shows a very rapid decline in oil demand, or rapid oil demand peak for the long run. The cause of this rapid decline is not the pandemic. This is Relate, this relate to the need to meet the climate goal. If two degrees target or 1.5 degrees target should be met, all demand need to be reduced in this pathway. So the interpretation of this rapid decline is very important. But apart from this very rapid decline, 
we may see the decline in oil demand in the long term caused by the pandemic or caused by the social economic transformation resulted from the pandemic. And peak oil demand itself is a very serious implication for producing economy, producing countries' economy. In the previous analysis made by IEJ, in particular the Middle East, the net result on the GDP or the export revenue is so large. Middle East may see the decrease of 1.6 trillion of GDP or 13% of nominal GDP loss as compared to the business as usual future if we see that peak oil demand and lower prices. And if this happens, I think it's quite possible that the Middle East or the other producing countries should accelerate their economic diversification policy. Currently, many countries are very much dependent on oil. It is fine, as far as the oil is a dominant energy source and demand continues to grow, but if things change, I think that producing economy need to understand the possible problem and to accelerate the, the economic reform. That's why now many Middle East and producing countries are very keen on the economic reform and the use of innovative technology. I'll come back to them later, particular with the story about the blue hydrogen or blue ammonia taken initiative by the Saudi Arabia. Electricity, even without the coronavirus, I do believe that electricity is going to be a very, very important source of our final energy consumption. Electricity will be the key source of the, our city life, civil life and economic life. And possibly and very likely when information technology and digitalization is accelerating its pace under the post-corona world, I think that electricity is going to be more and more important. And more important electricity sectors need to face the so-called 4D challenge, decarbonization, deregulation, digitalization, and decentralization, which all familiar with you and a very common challenge for everybody in the electricity sector. The problem is that these 4Ds is a very complicated relation and sometimes it stands on the trade-off relation. The best example is the decarbonization and the deregulation. Deregulation means that the introduction of market force to introduce a competition in the marketplace. When the competition is introduced, market players need to choose the cheapest cost option. Sometimes the cheapest option available in the market price place is coal. So everything is left for the market mechanism. The result is not compatible with the decarbonization effect. So I think that the 4D challenge is very complicated. And at the same time, when electricity is going to be very so important, the electricity price affordability and electricity supply stability and security, resilience is a very, very important or top priority for many countries. And furthermore, to protect the price affordability, supply stability, security, there's a new emerging risk or threat such as large scale increase in variable renewables or cyber attack. So I think that the one post corona war lead to the increasingly important role of electricity need to play in our total energy picture. I think these factors should be well considered and taken into the electricity and energy policy in respective country. And the Green Deal is also a very complicated issue. Of course, low carbonization, decarbonization effort continue to be very important agenda for every country. Malaysia, Japan, European countries need to seriously consider low carbonization, decarbonization. But 
corona situation change the perception because of the increase of the recovery, importance of recovery, the survival, security, safety of the citizen, the people in the country lead to the situation in which decarbonization agenda may be relativized. So I think that the decarbonization local nation initiative is going to be taken or promoted, continue to be promoted in various countries, that the pace or the degree of the strength may be different by region and country. But now European countries, EU in particular, is arguing, no, no, no. We are doing the, the post-corona recovery and clean up of energy system, in other words, green investment, simultaneously. That so-called the green deal. But the, again, the question mark is whether they can really successful or not, because this is again, very large scale social experiment. So we are now seeing the result of the EU model. But anyway, the promotion of green investment, renewable hydrogen, whatever, requires a very strong policy support and the technology development and the cost reduction and cost burden sharing will be the key issues. And we will see that the, the, because of the effect of the policy, it's quite likely that the global CO2 emission can be reduced from the business as usual pathway, which is shown in the blue line on your right hand side, difference scenario. In IEJ scenarios, advanced technology scenario can see that the large scale reduction of CO2 up to 2050, but it's still far away from the aspirational goal of two degrees target. So we need to enhance the effort if we really want to see that the two degrees target to be met. And in this regard, many countries are hoping that the renewable energy will play, play a bigger role. Yes, it is true, says in, in Malaysia and in Japan and in many parts of the world. And actually that the renewable capacity, solar people, wind, bioenergy, etc., is increasing its capacity. It is true. It's very beneficial in terms of the protection of energy uh, security and GHG reduction. But as IEJ analysis shows, not only renewable, but all other energy sources, uh, every energy source is not perfect in terms of renewable energy. To meet its variable nature of supply, integration cost factor need to be considered. So when the, the share of VRE increased, the pink part of integration cost, battery cost, or expansion, grid expansion cost, etc., it should increase very rapidly. So there is some possible optimal point that the share of VRE is, on, in, is concerned in terms of the total electricity portfolio. In terms of the cost, I said, if at what cost, at whatever cost, they need, uh, the government decided to go on the promotion of renewable, it's possible, technically, uh, economically possible, that the result is the effect on the affordability of electricity to consumer and industries. And the point, last point, but not this point, is the geopolitical tension. As symbolized in the US-China relation, Titan relation, that now we are seeing the very difficult geopolitical relation by many countries in the world. And if this situation continues and the world is transformed into the more geopolitical high tension world, the priority may shift from economic efficiency to security and geopolitics. And this may lead to the revision of global supply chain based on the cost minimum concept. And think that the me fast and the priority of alliance or priority of sphere of interest will lead to the higher cost to the global economic system, which has a downward pressure on the global energy demand. And when the 
global supply chain is reviewed and revised, I think that there will be the possible difference in the pattern of regional energy demand growth. For example, if the global supply chain is going out from China to Malaysia or ASEAN country or India, the global energy, uh, energy demand in China, the growth in Chinese energy demand may be lower and at the global uh, energy demand growth in India or ASEAN country will be accelerated. And respective countries, China, India, ASEAN country, need to enhance and energy security in this high geopolitical tension world. So energy self-sufficiency, diversification of energy sources, and the strategic alliance is keyword. So depending on the availability of accessibility of technology and resources, respective country need to pursue the pathway to promote the nuclear or hydrogen, renewable or CCS or whatever. And in this regard, I finally touch upon the, the hydrogen issues. Hydrogen is now paying a very big, big, big attention in the world. Why? If we really want to decarbonize the system, hydrogen can be a mass. And hydrogen can be produced by various resources from fossil fuel, renewable, nuclear, waste. And hydrogen can be used by many purpose, power generation, transportation, heating, industrial. So if really want to decarbonize the system, the hydrogen need to play a very important role. And another important side of the picture is many fossil resource rich country are paying, paying attention to the potential hydrogen production, so-called blue hydrogen. If oil demand peak or demand peak for fossil fuel is likely to emerge, they need to best we utilize their existing asset, namely fossil fuel. That's why Middle East, such as Saudi Arabia and Japan, is now working very closely to promote the concept of blue hydrogen. Of course, hydrogen is a very costly option, and also technologically and socially, the hurdle is still high. And the cost reduction effort now, Saudi Arabia and Japan decided to take a first step to promote the blue ammonia, not the blue hydrogen, to have the kickoff start to go to the pathway of blue hydrogen. And last month, Saudi Arabia and IEJ made a joint press announcement, press release, to have the first, world first ever blue ammonia shipment to Japan. Because Saudi Arabia is very keen to the concept in the, the G20 uh, summit, I think that we need to continue to work together. So I think this kind of innovative technology can be the key solution to address the global energy transition. I'll stop here and to take questions and thank you very much indeed. And I do hope that we have a very fruitful and lively discussion from now on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank Prof. You, Prof. for your insightful talk. First questions, Prof. Based on the post corona war, what role could hydrogen play in the Malaysia energy transition? Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Asmaiza, for your interesting question. Uh, I uh, answer very briefly. Yes, it depends on how far you would like to go on the decarbonization. As I mentioned that the hydrogen is regarded as a very, very, say, I, I would say the promising, possibly promising solution to address the decarbonization agenda. But again, decarbonization and low carbonization is a little bit different. If you really want to low carbonize the system, you can increase the share of natural gas at the cost of coal, for example. But if you would like to see the, the decarbonization, the decarbonization system, you need uh, some contribution from hydrogen. So I think, as I, as, I said, as I mentioned, it depends on how far you can go on. But 
before you can decide to go on the very far end, you may need to start the R&D. As I mentioned, the technological supremacy, supremacy is a keyword. And if everything is happening in the world and you, Malaysia is just watching, uh, you may be late for this late race for the technological technology supremacy supremacy. And one best one possible way is best utilize your domestic fossil fuel resources. You have good resources in oil and natural gas in particular, and this hydrocarbon may be turned into the, the blue ammonia, blue hydrogen, which can be exported to the consuming nation. So I think that uh, there are many, many ways that you can consider that uh, uh, utilization uh, of hydrogen or ammonia as a source for the energy export and also the energy supply in the domestic market. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. Uh, second question, Prof. Uh, Malaysia still seems to prioritize coal over LNG, despite the low cost of LNG at this stage. Is price of coal still lower than imported LNG, Prof? The question is regarding to the uh, Malaysian domestic situation. Uh, yes, Prof. Okay. Uh, to answer the question, I need the, the very detailed and the respective uh, price that the uh, Malaysian domestic consumer are paying to their coal supply and gas supply. Yes, it is true that now LNG, in particular the spot LNG market, declined very substantially. At one time, that the spot LNG quotation in Asian market is lower than two dollars per million BTU, which is really extremely low. But then we need to ask a question: Can you actually import LNG at this spot price level or not? If you are successfully import one cargo of spot LNG at say two dollars per million BTU, you may say that this very low price of LNG is competing, it can compete with local coal or coal import at the electricity generation side. But uh, it is still not easy for any market player, not only a Malaysian market player, to take best uh, utilization of lower spot LNG because in many cases, LNG is not, more, not the term contract. So taking the spot low prices is rather difficult for everybody. Assuming that if Malaysian consumer has a benefit to see that the two dollar medium BTU natural gas prices for sustainable period, I think that it may be a possibility that the natural gas can really compete with the coal prices in Malaysia. But again, two dollar gas price is not in a sense sustainable. If two dollar continues, energy supplier is very difficult to make any decision to final investment decision for the future supply contract. So I think that uh, it's a matter of market decision and also it's a actually market operation. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Uh, Prof, is it possible for us uh, to have one uh, one more questions? One, one more last two. question. Okay. All right. So uh, this is will be our last questions, Prof. In your opinion, what will power the post-pandemic global energy economic recovery? Yeah, sorry, one second, please. Uh, in your opinion, Prof, mm -hmm. what will power the post-pandemic global energy economic recovery? What power? Uh, what will power the post-pandemic global energy economic recovery? This is a uh, question uh, from the attendee. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, uh, he want to ask your opinion on 
uh, what will uh, post-pandemic global energy economic recovery uh, drive by uh, which power perhaps? Power means uh, energy source or? Uh, yeah, um, what, are, what, what are the drive factor perhaps uh, for the global energy economic recovery? Mm, I, I'm not sure whether I can clearly understand the question, uh, but uh, as far as I know that uh, government intervention is really needed to solve this uh, extreme disasters. In normal circumstances, uh, many government says our oh, economic recession is a problem, we can do something, but uh, most fundamentally that the economy should left for the market mechanism. This is a very typical uh, the attitude. Of course, uh, when the economy is going down, that the government need to do, do something. But this time, the scale or the magnitude of the economic damage is so large, unprecedented. So, Every country made a large scale payment or large scale expenditure to solve the problem. Employment and uh, people to save the lower income people. So there's no way that the government needs a heavy handed intervention. And this kind of heavy handed intervention is giving the various possible uh, potential areas. In some countries, uh, they are targeted area. The, the, the typical example includes that the European Union. As I mentioned earlier, European Union is continue uh, is the same that the Green Deal is the possible pathway to help European economy. Even before the Corona pandemic, EU Commission said that the Green Deal is a long term growth strategy for Europe. But now they are saying that this is the tool to uh, save our economy from the disaster caused by a pandemic. So I think that this is again that the policy priority. In Europe, European nations or EUs agreed to uh, set the carbon neutrality in the year 2050. So to meet the carbon neutrality and economic recovery, they gave priority on the Green Deal. So this is a political decision made by the, the European Commission. But again, our problem is that whether this Green Deal can really actually create the environment or actually save the economy, it's uncertain. It's a big social experiment, EU model social experiment. If this can find turn out to be a very great success. Many countries may follow, but I don't know. Thank you, Professor Ken Koyama, for your very insightful talk for today by webinar. Please kindly send us your feedback by filling the feedback form. It would great for us to receive your response. Take care, stay safe and have a good day. Thank you.